everyone, it's Bob McCurney with This Month in Realty, and we are continuing our group sessions today. I am so happy to have these amazing women in real estate with us today. I'm going to let them go around and introduce themselves, and then we'll get into the discussion. So let's start with Marnetta. Hi, Bob. <laughs> Marnetta Arnett here. I'm in North Orlando, Florida area. What else do you want to know? Tell me a little bit about the market in North Orlando. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. There's nothing for sale, and then if something does come on the market... It goes right away. It's probably the same in everybody's market from what I'm hearing. Okay, we'll dig into that. Multiple in offers. I mean, if you want to sell something, it's great. If you want to buy something, it is tricky. Okay. Okay, great. Then we have Shweta Janchi. Hi, I'm Shweta. I work in uh, Irvine, but I primarily serve all of Orange County. If you have to get in touch with me, you can check out my website, shwetasellsoc.com. A way to plug your site in the first three seconds. That's great. <laughs> okay, Lynn. Hey, guys. Um, I'm Lynn Jagosh. I'm with John L. Scott Real Estate. I'm here in Puyallup, which is about 30 miles south of Seattle. I'm in a different county than Seattle. Seattle's King County. I'm in Pierce County. Um, it's a crazy seller's market here. Houses last about three days on the market. They go for far over asking price, 10, 12, 20, 30 offers, depending on the house. Um, my last buyer on the seventh offer, I got them under contract. And seven is not a bad number. Seven's not bad. So, I mean, it's just crazy. In Pierce County, everywhere around here, we have about a half a month of, of inventory available. So it's not much. Okay. And now we have sisters, Irene and Fabi here. Tell us a little bit about, tell us, you know, about you and about your market there. Yes, of course. So my name is Fabi and thank you for this platform. I'm super honored to be here alongside you lovely ladies. Um, I reside in Temecula and very familiar, uh, similar to your guys' stories, you know, homes are going off the market within the first week, three days. Um, offers 30 offers in each home so seven is not a bad number mm -mm. Um, uh, this is my sister Irene we learn, we work alongside one another and we uh we just we really truly enjoy it and I'm super excited and do you, you want me to introduce myself sure <laughs> yeah so my name is Irene Gutierrez um I cover the Camp Pendleton Temecula part of the Temecula area as well the military spouse um so I work with a lot of military out here and same thing as you ladies, and I'm pretty sure, Bob, you're experiencing the same situation. It's tough being a buyer's agent at the moment. Very awesome to be a listing agent. So um, that's kind of like how the market is here in Southern California. Okay. And Bob so first question I'm going to throw out to everybody is, what is something you wish you had known when you gotten into real estate? That it's not easy. <laughs> And even yeah. if you are your own boss, uh, you have to be willing to like work at weekends. You have to be willing to work late in the evening. You just have to be extremely flexible with your schedule. You can have a set time, but you have to be accommodating. Yeah, definitely. To add to that, I would definitely say that I didn't know it was such a shark tank. <laughs> I'm such yeah. a person and sometimes some agents can be very mean but it's definitely gotten me to have a rougher skin and just be more stern than anything and um definitely uh one thing that I wish somebody told me is don't dig yourself or don't be so hard on yourself don't dig yourself such a big hole because at the end of the day you're the one that needs to get yourself out of it and um it's so true you know in the beginning you're really hard on yourself and it's just the way I look at real estate, it, it has a lot of labor work into it before you get the crops and benefit to it. So definitely don't be hard on yourself. Be hopeful and uh, keep your spirits high. I wish someone would have told me all of that instead of, you know, they make it seem <laughs> selling sunset super easy, but it's not. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I wish somebody would have tell me, told me. Well, when I, I wish so when, I'm sorry, go ahead. We went at the same time. Go ahead. I was just going to say when I was really new at real estate, I was thinking back and there's so much you don't know. This was everything. And then people start to teach you and you realize everything you learn has all these other things along with it. And you try to take it all in or figure it all out. And it's overwhelming. It's like trying to drink out of the fire hose kind of a thing. And you pick something, you find your right niche and you find out what you're good at, what you like doing. And, and you kind of work into it that way. But then you still need coaching and guidance and training and reading books. 
you don't learn anything in real estate school, maybe how to stay out of jail, but <laughs> then you have to figure out how to actually work the business, find the leads, find the people, help them. How can you help them the best? What information do they need so that you can give them the best advice? Anyway, that's my two cents. That's mm -hmm. kind of what I was going to say is that the knowledge base is huge. It's not just showing homes, decorating, gardening, you know, it's all the stuff that we love that we, that they portray on television it is not that at all. And I mean, you have to just keep learning and you have to keep yourself sharp. Evolving. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Continue to evolve. Um, mm -hmm. That's one thing that I would tell myself is get yourself a mentor, someone that's going to guide you through the process. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate to have Coach Bob, but someone that's definitely going to walk you through it and stay educated. Just because you've been in the industry for 20, 30 years, it's not always going to make you the best knowledgeable realtor because times change. So as realtors, we have to educate ourselves every single year on laws and rules and the do's and the don'ts. So it's like, it's a continuing job, I would say, but it's not really a job because we work 24 seven instead of the nine to five, <laughs> but it's definitely something that you have to always stay on top of mind. If you do it part-time, you know, it's going to be tough for you, but you have to commit to it full-time. Definitely evolve. So for me, it was a matter of, I knew this was going to be work and I'm an ambitious person. If there's a merit badge out there, I'll go get it. And I was told early on, get your GRI, Graduate Realtor Institute. Then I was told, get your CRS, because once you get your CRS, only 3% of agents get their CRS, and you will be getting referrals out the yin-yang, because CRS only refers to CRS. Then it was, get your broker's license. Then it was more and more. What, what drove me was not, I thought if I achieved this, I'd be set. If I achieved this, I'll be set. If I put an ad in this in the newspaper, my phone will ring off the hook. Mm -hmm. What got me to where I am is that I was always going to the next rung yeah. mm -hmm. and what i was told early on was get to this rung and you'll be safe no the next rung and the next rung and the next rung it's the perpetual growth mindset mm -hmm. and i wish i i knew i had it but i didn't realize that was the journey versus the destination mm -hmm. yeah so. it's like a, a muscle we got to work on to continue to stay in shape and fit that's the way i look at it yeah yeah, the, the what's next routine. So question for you that I've asked other people, is the bar too low in your state to become a real estate agent? Oh, yeah. 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 I know people who just basically um, are dentists or like engineers and they want to sell their house. So they just go get their license, sell their house, and then you're done. And that's the only use they're going to do. Or if they have a family member who wants to buy a house, they'll help them out because, hey, this is, this is a house that we like and you put an offer for us. And they think that's how simple it is. And so everyone passes this exam and can do two deals in their whole lifetime and call themselves a realtor. Yeah, I definitely feel like it's like uh, before 2008 or during 2008, anyone who breeds qualifies. <laughs> so that's how it is with uh, how I view the bar, um, uh, you know, with getting your real estate license, it's just super easy. I think in COVID, a lot of people got their license just because they were sitting at home and they just got a bunch of license and um, they thought it's going to be easy. But that's what I've heard is like once the, with this whole shift in the way things are moving with real estate, that in the next two or three years, a whole bunch of realtors are going to be washed away because they just got their license so easy and thought it was easy to stay in the business. And now they're going to realize it's not so easy <laughs> just going to be washed away again and I, and I feel like that just comes with a, a society as whole as a whole you know what we see on the internet is not real life and that just no comes That's <laughs> an illusion. what we see on TikTok, the shows TikTok, TikTok makes it seem like it's super easy to get your license oh you want to you know like all these like investors or like stuff like that it makes it really easy to like Oh, just, all you, I can help you pass your real estate license. All you need to do is these three courses and that's it. And so I feel like it is true. These next couple of years are really going to set the guidelines for who's going to make it in the industry and who's not. And if you're set on your old ways, you're not open to being coachable. You're not open to receiving criticism. It's really going to wash out a lot of realtors that are out there that just got it just to do the ones and the twos types of transactions. 
Well, and we have to work with really unmotivated real estate agents that we know are not taking care of their clients the way we take care of them. So I'm okay with the bar being set low for them because it is true that 20% 20, uh, 20 of us do 80% of the work. The bar is always going to be very high for myself. So I don't worry about them or anybody else that I'm having to do, deal with. They're, they're terrible and they, they won't get to the level that they want to be at by not taking care of their clients or learning or understanding what real estate really is. It's really about service and taking care of your clients. So I just really feel like I'm okay with the bar being set low. They're not going to make it the way we want to make it. And so I don't, I, I just keep it out of my mind. Very true. Okay. But I think it's sad. I learned when I was really new to, I think I've been in a year or something, that most realtors fail out within the first five years. Hardly, very few people make it five years. Most people don't make it the first year because they realize they have no money coming in. And even about, even if they are hardworking and they're trying to work, you almost can't learn it and implement it fast enough. It's not just a matter of being hardworking. It's knowing which work to do. People are doing the wrong kind of work at the wrong kind of time. So you, if you don't have somebody helping you know which way to go, like, you can spend an awful lot of time doing things that don't work. And I've seen people in our office just fail out doing crazy stunts or the next magic pill that's going to make you rich. And it's not like that. So sometimes think, people have good intentions to work hard. The people who are getting in just to sell their own house, they're not really realtors. They're just hacks. But the people who think they're going to make a, a business out of it, they're going to be rich. They're going to have their brand. And, but they don't know how to set it up or do it. They really don't know what to do. There's no clear role to go unless you have somebody helping you. I agree. I absolutely agree. So let's talk about real estate as an industry here. As women in real estate, do you feel being in real estate, I think real estate is dominated by women and gay men. <laughs> is real estate an industry that's easier for women to participate in than other industries? And what about the glass ceiling in real estate? You can achieve great greatness as an agent or as a team lead, but the major brands, I only know of one woman CEO of, of any of the major brands. Mm -hmm. Talk about the glass ceiling, if there is one in real estate versus other industries and where you see that changing. I don't know. Maybe uh -huh. because as women, we tend to be more nurturing, more, we tend to be more nurturing, more emotional. And when, you know, when you think of a businessman, you know, you think of someone in a suit. And so they tend to be like more negotiable, more contract, more everything. So I feel like there's a stigma when it comes to that about women, um, you know, having a glass ceiling, especially like it's, it's no data, right? Men are tend to make more money on the dollar than women are. So I just feel like that's kind of like how it is, but it's also great. Like in my industry, I work with a lot of families where we see that nurture, we see the family, so we can relate to them. We're not working with a lot of investors. That's what I see in my market. Hmm. And to, to add to that, I don't know what your ladies' experiences have been, or I don't know if it's just because I'm a, probably my age too that people might not take me serious, but it, it has come to my attention and acknowledgement that every, not every time, but there's been times and incidents where I do speak to a male and he's been in real estate for so long, he undermines me and my ability and my potential. And it's not until I would have my broker step in and say the same thing. It's just being delivered from a male's perspective that now I'm being considered and negotiated, you know, and fighting for my clients. Um, that's, that's happened to me numerous times. So again, I can't distinguish if it's just the agents I'm coming across with and I'm just having bad luck or my age and just having to be a female. I don't know if it's a combination of all, um, or maybe, like I said, sometimes I, my sister's like, you just come off too nice. And I'm like, well, I just, I feel like I work with alongside other agents and we could cordially get along. I don't feel like I have to be rude or super out of my nature to, get a deal close. Um, but I have learned to be a little bit more stern, you know, um, but I have come across that a lot that men have a sense of authority or just the way they speak, um, throughout a transaction with me has been more, um, demeanoring than anything. Well, I can, I'm going to talk, speak to that because I'm very nice. There's a difference between, between being rude 
and firm and knowing what you can do for your clients. So I think maybe, you know, getting, I just don't have that problem with people pushing me around. But a long time ago, I was told that I needed to kind of step it up and not be so nice. I mean, I'm still nice. I'm very kind, but I've learned over the last 11 years to be more firm with people. And I don't feel like I get pushed around. I never feel like I can't compete with men or anything else. It never even enters my mind. So maybe, I don't know how long you've been doing this, but I think it comes with experience and also kind of a mindset that you're taking. It, it's just a real mindset and it, it pretty soon it'll flip and you won't feel like you're maybe being undermined. Yeah, I don't feel that at all. I think that did switch when somebody, hence my sister was like, oh, I see why. You know, the way I'm talking, it just came off really like, ah, you know, and so now it's like, we need this, this and that. And I'm not being rude. I'm not being, you know, I'm just mm -hmm. being straight to the point. No extra me, but um, it has helped me. So with and I think it's okay to be lovely and to be nice and to be kind. I mean, I can tell, I mean, you can tell when you're talking to me, you're lovely and you have a sweet demeanor. So don't change that. Don't change that so that you can fit into other people's boxes. Just make other people fit into your box. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Marnetta? Glass ceiling. So when I was young and cute like you are, I, I got walked <laughs> on a lot. But there's, there's something that happened. Like there was a, a thing in me that just like enough already. And I, my tone changed and my authoritative attitude changed. And I'm talking to you like I know what I'm talking about. People don't give me the same kind of nonsense they did. I don't have the same problem. I, I was thinking about that earlier this week. I've got some guys who work with me and investors who work with me because I'm a woman. And I'll tell them straight, I don't play any of these macho games. Like, you know, like they're tired of that nonsense. They want the straight truth and they want someone who knows what they're talking about. So it is a mindset, though, as long as you believe that people are going to do that to you, if you believe there's a glass ceiling, it's glass because it's not really there. You put it there. I don't agree with glass ceiling at all in what I'm doing because you can, you can make as much money as you're worth. As hard as you want to work, you selling houses or businesses or lifestyles, you can make millions of dollars if you want to. Maybe I don't, I don't want to be in corporate America ever again. I don't want to be the CEO of anybody anybody's large company. I don't want that lifestyle. So I don't care if some man has it. I don't care who's doing it. Doesn't bother me a bit because I've got my little groove over here and this is what I control. This is what I do. There is no glass ceiling. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. What's the craziest things that's happened to you <laughs> either out on a showing or a listing? Like I've been in a car accident with a client in the car. Oh, I've accidentally rear-ended the client who was in front of me. Oh, <laughs> uh, I've shown a house with people in bed who we think were sleeping, but we probably don't think they were sleeping. And I've shown a house with a loaded handgun sitting on the dresser. That's wow. hard to top, Bob. Are you going to start with that? Yeah, well, you know, go from there. Well, I, I will add to that. Um, I don't know if you guys, feel free to add me on my social media, Fabi Gutierrez on Facebook, Fabi Gutierrez official on Instagram. I just shot an episode of crazy stories that happened to realtors. Feel free to share. We would love to have your approval and consent to share them. Um, but mine was, I was doing a list, uh, showing a listing. We were so excited, you know, going through the flow. I opened the door and I think that person was dead. I think huh? he's dead. I think he like he looked green, gray, purple. Oh no. God. Like an oxygen ventilator. So I'm like, clearly you're supposed to get oxygen. And he didn't have too much wine in Temecula. And it was in Chula Vista. Mm -hmm. And it was in Chula Vista and in San Diego. And I freaked out with my client there and I ran downstairs. And luckily he was a Marine. He was like, oh, but that person had no reaction to us being in there. And then my, I called my sister like, oh my God, I think I thought someone dead. And she was just like, well, call 911. And I just called the listing agent. And I, I was like, <laughs> what was empty. Yeah. And the listing, the, the listing agent, he's like, oh, he'll be all right. I'm like, oh. <laughs> needless to say, we did not put an offer. We did not get like that home, but I, it was. That's my, one of my stories. 
Oh my! But God. We all have many. I have one. Sorry. No, till this day, I don't know if that person was really alive. <laughs> so. That's terrible. Go ahead. Sorry. I had somebody that was living in the attic of one of my listings, and I went in wow. to. Uh, meet a furnace person that was going to do some repairs. My client kind of lived out of town, so I was taking care of it. And I noticed that somebody had showered in the shower. It was wet and there was some towels in it. They were wet. And so I called her and I said, you know, has somebody been in the house? And I said, because I feel like there's somebody here. And I was there by myself. And so I, I was waiting for somebody to come and, you know, we put ourselves in all kinds of situations. Okay, and I, we'll talk about that. Oh gosh, I went and waited out. At first I sat down I was, and it had a little at, upstairs bonus room that had an attic and somebody was held up in that attic with, they had bowls of cheer. I didn't find them. He, they, they didn't come out or they weren't there when I was there, but they had taken a shower clearly, but they found bowl cereal, and there was a refrigerator. So they were keeping stuff in the refrigerator and they were sleeping and living up in that attic. They had cereal up there and bowls and spoons. And it freaked me out for about a year because every time I went into a list, I thought, is somebody in here? This is really, I mean, people can hide anywhere. So that kind of scared me. And I, my senses are always up when I'm in listings or at open, uh, you know, by myself, I let my husband know where I am and everything. And I, you know, somebody came for the furnace and everything was fine, but it's freaky. I mean, that's a weird thing to know that somebody's that was just there that's living up in the attic yeah. of a vacant house. Yeah. I got kidnapped in one of my um, showings. What? Yeah. I almost got kidnapped in one of my showings. So oh my goodness. I showed up, not the greatest neighborhood in San Diego, and I showed up and um, it was late later in the evening. It was, you know, it was during summertime. And so I'm showing up I walk up because, you know, parking is a, such a heavy situation. So I walk up to there and um, a car kind of corners me and I really can't run anywhere. So they corner me and it's two guys and they're like, get in the car. And I'm like, oh no, I'm okay. Thank you. And they're like, we're not asking, we're telling you to get in the <laughs> car. And then they tried to have a conversation with me and then they started speaking a different language amongst themselves, which, which was in Spanish because I speak Spanish. And then they look at each other and then they look at me and he puts his hand like on the door, like almost like if he's going to open it. And I'm like, oh, my client's here. Hey, you know, like some random people are walking up and they just sped off and just. <gasps> That's scary. I texted my sister, the last license plate number and the color of the car. Mm -hmm. And I told my clients, I said, let's move on to the next listing. This is not a good. Wow. That is scary. That's very scary. And after that, you know, I always carry a pen or something with me. Um, now I carry a cane, obviously, because I can't walk now, but I always carry something with me when I'm doing showings and I share my location with my sister or have a list of where all the houses I'm going um, because of that situation. Yeah. Okay. Wow. My story is not as half scary as yours. I'm not even going to share. Mine was a very funny story, but that's the, nothing scary in mine. Go ahead and share the funny. The funny is just me on my own. I finish my open house, everything. And then I go lock up the Supra and put the keys inside and I realize, okay, where's my phone? My phone is in the house and I've locked myself out of this oh, house. And no. It's a vacant house. I'm like, how do I go back in this house now? And it's like Sunday evening. So I'm like, somebody needs to come. Some agent needs to come and open the door for me so I can go get my <laughs> Oh my gosh. And luckily I went in the back and I took a I went back home, got a ladder, climbed up the backyard, and somehow jumped in back into the house. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, here's my phone. Let's get out again, lock it all properly, and then do this. But it was too hilarious. You broke into the home. <laughs> <laughs> this career now is not for the faint in. of heart. Right. I want video of you breaking in. <laughs> video of me dangling out the window as you're crawling through yeah well that'd be yeah. good like a reenactment since you can't do the actual being locked out you could do a reenactment video reenactment yeah marnetta what about you crazy i don't have anything to top any or even compete with you guys stories but i have been uh, locked out of the you know I've, I've locked my key in the house when we had the old-fashioned keys that were part of your phone i've done that and then that was exciting the the the, the strangest thing god there's so many weird ones 
I did lock, get locked in the backyard once. I was previewing a house for somebody and I always come in the house and I leave the key in the block so I won't lose it in the house somewhere and not be able to find it when I leave. But I went in and I'm videoing the house and I went in the back porch and it was one of those doors where you unlock the door, but it doesn't unlock at the handle. So when the door blew shut behind me, I'm locked on the porch in a vacant house with a high fence and there's nothing to climb on. And I, there's nobody in the neighborhood. I'm like, hello, because anybody could come in the front door and they could open the door, but there's nobody anywhere. And so there's nothing to climb on to get my ass over the fence and, and do one of these. So I finally broke the fence. It was a PVC fence and I just kept, I threw myself against it a bunch of times and I broke yeah. it and I rolled out and then I was able to get my keys and leave. And then I never came back and I didn't buy, we didn't put an offer in on that house at all. But, <laughs> but that was, that's, that was just like. Scandalized. Did you end up paying for a fence? Nobody seen me do it. Nobody can prove I was there. I didn't, no thing. I didn't do it. And y'all like recording this either. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. I know you are. But, but it was like, I mean, I don't know what, what else do you do? I mean, I mean, I could be there for days. It wasn't like now where you have showings every 10 minutes. Yeah. You know. I, I, you gotta the, do what you gotta do i didn't know i was like it was it was scary it wasn't nearly as good as the stuff y'all came up with but that's all i got for now if i had more time to think about it i probably had some weird weird ones but no i i'm, I'm definitely with you i in situations like that's kind of like when you get a ring stuck on your finger you panic you want to like chop your finger off i would have definitely ran through that fence <laughs> i i kept hitting it i'm thinking oh my god because it was it was also it was bolted it had like the deadbolt you know like the, not the deadbolt, but you know what those those bolt. So there's nothing you. There's no way to get over the top of that fence. There, there was nothing. And then if you do, you still have to you know, fall to the other side. So going through the fence was a better option. <laughs> that is hilarious. It's funny. Oh man. There is somebody pounding something right outside my door. Can you hear it? No. Do you hear it? I don't hear it. No. Okay. It's all in your head, Bob. So no, it's not. So question for you, what does your town need to do to be better in the next, you know, if you're, you're suddenly the mayor of, of your town. Oh. For us, for Dallas-Fort Worth, it's definitely mass transit. We are a city of highways and tollways because, you know, our, our, our politicians loved tollways for a while because they were getting something on the backside to put the tollway in. What is it that you see that your city needs that would make it better for the citizens? Traffic. I think better public transportation would be nice because we are all in our own cars and uh, more homes are being built right now. And so when I bought my first home, I thought the furthest that we went was like, oh my God, that's too far. Who wants to live so far away? And But now there's an equally bigger town that's been built past that in the last 15 years. So the number, number of homes have doubled, but the traffic has become crazy. I wish there was more public transportation that... Uh, that we could use and I've otherwise it's just too many cars on the road. Yep. That's the same issue that we're going through, especially out here from Camp Pendleton or from Oceanside to Temecula Marietta. It's just the flow of traffic. And they're they are expanding streets and the highway. Um, but it's still there's only like three exits to into Temecula and there's so many new construction in Temecula leads you to French Valley, Winchester. So for us it's the traffic, but I think that's all of Southern California kind of an issue. Yeah. In addition to that, I, I wish we could do something to, I don't know how it would come to, to, to be of support, um, but definitely something about the homelessness. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the homelessness is coming from, obviously we live really close to the border, but a lot of it comes from San Diego coming down here and then um, oh, yeah. Los Angeles coming in over here. So we are starting to see a little bit more of that. Nothing too crazy, but I, I wish we could, we could be of a resource or a help, or I don't know how that would go, but definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah Lynn, I think another that? thing I would want is like probably schools, more schools. I think just so many homes, but not enough schools. So just Oh. Our schools are being just impacted so much, I feel. Um, the first thing for me that came to mind was the, uh, doing something about the homelessness in the area. And I think that's just a, you know, it's a social issue that is very hard for, to, to manage. And I'm on the outside, outskirts of the city and not necessarily Puyallup, but there's another lar larger city, Tacoma. 
and it's unfortunate but they're they migrate to us and they're in, encroaching with that along with the lack of police presence has um, spurred on some crime um, and it's everywhere and I live in a lovely place and it's it's you know a suburb and it's beautiful um, but I think that not one of us can aren't speaking to this issue so um, but that's a sad thing when you're showing houses and there's a homeless camp across the street or something like that I mean that's really I mean I you know, it's scary. I'm afraid, just like the yeah. guy camped out in the attic. I mean, I just don't. I, so. Yeah, I, I was going to add to that. I don't know if this is a little side note, and I could share, Bob. Go. Um. Uh. Yesterday was my first showing of showing homes by myself to actually video record, and I just, I, I had this like sense of anxiety going in, just maybe because of COVID, it's been such a long time that I've done it, but I was feeling that way, you know, like, what if someone's in here? I'm the only one in here. And I know um, we, ha I, I have pepper spray, I have all this stuff, but I never thought to like bring it in. I'm like, no, it's too late. But it, um, you know, with homelessness, again, you just, and it's not to say homelessness, like people, they're bad people, but um, there is a lot of mental illnesses, disease, mm -hmm things like that. So I, it, it did help. Like I need to find something to ease myself because I didn't have that then uh, the anxiety or just like being really uneasy. Like I literally showed the home and, you know, and like ran out as quick as I could. Um, so I need to, I don't know if you guys have any tips or not, if you've ever dealt with that or how you're, I'm pretty sure you, since you had someone in the attic and you probably <laughs> felt vulnerable like you're there and you're like what the heck someone's yeah. there you know what I don't pack heat yet but I've thought about it because but I always have my pepper spray I always have my phone in my hand um, I always let my husband know where I am we have a thing in our office if you have a problem and you're out of showing you call them and say you know I need the red I need the red file so that they know what to do and I, I've never had to do that I've never had to do any of that. Though. Just the but, red file thing. I just think if anybody is a nefarious person and they hear the red file, they're going to know that's code. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. I, they, I just that. know they, I don't use that. I would rather call my husband and have him call my, or dial 911. I've got that my phone in my hand ready to go at all times. There's a safety app. Google has mm -hmm. a safety app. I'm sure iPhone does. I mm -hmm. pop that. I hit one button. Five people immediately know where uh -huh. I'm at, and that I hit the safety app. Oh, that's a good thing. What's uh, the name yeah. of it, Bob? It's, it's literally called Google Safety. Uh -huh. Google Safety? Yeah, it's personal safety with Google. And if I hit the red button or the yellow button, it's going. It's going right now. Oh. Um, so, and I don't want to test that right now, but, you know, realtor safety is incredibly important. Lynn, I'm not trying to down you for the red file. No, it's, it is. I mean, I was just saying that that's something that my yeah. office has implemented along with everybody else. I wouldn't use that. I've got my own thing. You know, I'm always got a pepper spray and a phone in my hand ready to realtor, call someone. Realtor safety is incredibly important. Yeah, it is. And, well, you know, I think we're it's very like, vulnerable. Seven it's very vulnerable. Year get popped, you know, go missing. And I, I really, I urge my people, we don't do open houses alone. Open houses have to be done in pairs. Um, and anybody we show has to be pre-approved because if you're going to give up your digits to a lender, you're probably not going to knock me in the head and steal the TV. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, there's so many agents out there. There's an Uber app now for showing houses. Okay. Like, yeah, client pulls up in front of the house, looks at all the pictures, wants to see the house and gets on the app and it shows where the realtors are driving nearby. Realtor will come by and let you in. What? That's, bullshit for me because they, they're on there they're looking at all the fun stuff in the house they want they click you know the button and little sally comes over and lets them in they knock sally in the head and steal all the shit where's the safety in that app yeah i mean and and, and things are replaceable i i did have a uh an open That's house eating zillow now yeah i had an open house once where there was i have 
I don't want to say a lot of social media presence, but I have had a lot of weirdos of where they come into the office just to like strictly me meet, like meet me as a person. So when I, I am very hesitant when I post about open houses and this time um, that I did an open house, Irene couldn't be present and um, I had to do it. Right. So I did it. Luckily I had a lot of traffic, but there was a gentleman who just kept going in and out and he was super weird. And luckily there was another Marine there. He's like, do you know that guy outside? I was like, I do not. And he's been pacing back and forth, but I'm about to just cut it this open house short because I don't feel comfortable. He's like, well, we'll wait while you, you know, wrap it up and good. Yeah. But it, it, it is, I did I not. That, I think that's a limitation, I guess, in this business with women is that we're just so vulnerable when it comes to these things. That would be the ceiling, I guess. Oh, well, men are too. Yeah, so, men are too. too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing. I mean, I'm five foot six. My best defense is biting sarcasm. I don't think I'd really, you know, I've got little T Rex arms. I can't, you know, I'm not going to be. Able that to put one up out of five body. men is a victim of the, one out of five assaults is a man. Mm-hmm. so the, the, but the men are even more vulnerable because they don't think it can happen to them where we're a little bit more cautious mm. but yeah. okay so one out of five victims is a man that's what they said at the and at the, four and a half out of five assailants is a man i would say What's four out of five assailants is probably i'm here i'm being very sexist against my own gender but yes <clears throat> that's but, that yeah. of the men that speak up because there's a lot of shame that goes behind it exactly right so well, let's I, if there's, to- yeah, I'm sorry. I was going to say, if there's anything that I think is troubling in an open house, I'm not, I have walk, I'll walk out and I'll yeah. lock it and get in my car and drive away. I'm not going to sit there and be a sitting duck for it's anybody. You. In our representation agreements, which by the way, everybody better be doing buyer's rep and, mm-hmm. and listing agreements. Um, we have in there that if we feel unsafe, we can terminate a showing or terminate any action. We, we, um, we had an open house and the, my agent was working the open house. We had a lady come in and uh, the, the owner had left their friendly little dog at the open house and friendly little dog was just greeting everybody and showing them the house. This lady walks in and kicks the dog <gasps> and we threw her out of the house and she didn't want to leave. And I'm like, call the cops. The dog lives there. She doesn't. Wow. But so, yeah, that's the sort of thing you don't expect to see happen. I wouldn't even have the dog walking around, but it's also, know, but the owner for some reason left the dog there. It's the dog's house. So let's shift topics. Let's, let's okay. brighten this up a little bit. What do you do in your real estate practice to set aside time for yourself? Cause you I, know, every client wants your time right now. So and, certain things are like a must do for me. And then if it comes in my must do times and I'm just going to say, I have an appointment, I just can't make it. Um, must do's are like for me going to the gym my morning routine whatever in the afternoon I have to pick my child up or if I have to take up an appointment or whatever those are like blocked my family time with my dinner that those are blocked if things come in I'm I just say I'm busy right now I'm going to get back to you tomorrow or I have an appointment uh, we'll have to do this another time but those things are like sacred nothing comes right there for me yeah, I think I definitely agree with you. And that's something that I butt heads with Irene because I'm very, to get the best version of me, I have to take care of me. And that includes um, just gym time, family time. It's like a recharge, right? I yeah. don't want to wanna give someone the short end stick of me because I haven't had my sleep or, you know, haven't had my, my cup full. And um, Irene's very like, Irene could work real estate like 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. Like it just she she's wired that way, but I'm I'm not, and that, that's something that we do have to let, work with one another in terms of that. So that's something I let her know strictly. Like stick to the schedule, whatever you have going on. Um, put aside you know, time for yourself as well, because it's important in how you just... Because every every customer of yours has a time set for themselves. So you have to realize everyone does it. You're not, you won't, it won't be like weird if you're doing it for yourself. It's nothing like unusual. So you don't have to bend backwards for everybody. Yeah. And yeah. they will respect you for that. That's fine. Yeah. And I think the way that I... And if they don't, they usually shouldn't be your client. Yeah. And the way I've set it up for myself that has been very successful is when I know more 
more people would carry a nine to five job, I do most of the things that would be fulfilling for me during those times. So I am a little bit more available and reason with them, you know, uh, when those times are not nine to five. <laughs> Anyone else? I work 24 seven. I don't work 24 seven. I respond 24 seven. I have no boundary. You know, my husband's a lender, so he's right there with me. Um, so we eat, breathe, speak, talk, real estate 24 seven. Um, his me time is the gym, but even in the gym, he goes live and, you know, talks real estate. Um, cause he's also a realtor. Uh, we have no children. <laughs> so <laughs> real estate is our life. We love real estate. We, you know, but it's not just all talking real estate. We talk about investing and, you know, we look at other markets and where would we love to retire? So there's stuff like that, that we involve and incorporate into our talks, but yeah. I respond texts at like 10 o'clock at night. It doesn't bother me. And I know I read it for other people, but you know, that's why I say like, I didn't, I didn't leave the nine to five corporate world to work another nine to five. I work 24 seven. Wow. Just, Lynn, Marnetta, do you have any boundaries? I have my phone. I used to be 24 seven. I tell everybody else still, you can call me 24 seven for your convenience, but I will only answer the phone between 8 a.m and 8 30 p.m because it shuts off mm -hmm. at that time and it's been wonderful i sleep so much better because i've got quiet time in the evening there is no real estate emergency life or death that's going to happen at nine o'clock at night or ten o'clock at night yeah. and having the phone being able to ring at ten o'clock at night when you're just about to doze off that that was just wrong so the people understand that now and i was shocked that they didn't walk away from me when i wasn't available 24 7. they respect that if they leave me a message tonight, I'm going to get back to them. Five o'clock in the morning, I'll go ahead and send them back their text because I'll answer the phone if I see it. I do. But if I don't see it, I don't hear it. I don't have to be bothered with that. And I, Bob's been after me to get, take days off and I do that some. I'm not really good at it yet, but I take time off. I've been doing this a long time. I'm good taking Tuesday afternoon off. Yeah. And if I get, get calls when I get back from my time off, I work, that works for me. But yeah. Um, I still not, I'm not still not good at taking a whole day off though. We'll get better at it. Lynn? I think I've gotten a lot better at training my clients or letting my clients know that I have boundaries by not returning those, you know, after nine o'clock is kind of my cutoff yeah. point by not responding. I, you don't even have to tell them, but nine o'clock, I don't even call anybody after nine o'clock. That's my role for just being a human being. So I don't do that. And they, I don't respond to that for them. So, um, you train them how to teach you, how to, yes, how to, I, how to treat I, you. Yes. And I don't think that there's any lack of respect. Nobody ever says anything. And I, I try to take Sundays off for my time, my family, I have grown kids and I'm a grandma. So, um, I just try to take, Sundays off. Don't always. I my husband's a home inspector, so he gets it. Oh. Uh, sometimes he has to work on Sundays too. So, but um, and you know, Wednesdays is my personal time. Wednesday mornings is when I get my hair done. I try to I try to keep those appointments to Wednesday morning, Wednesdays and Sundays. Mm -hmm. But I like to work late. I, I'm at the office <laughs> a lot till eight thirty. That's just my gig. I like to be quiet in here and you know working. But um, I think as far as setting people up, I, I've done a good job of setting those boundaries. And my kids won't say that because I'm on my phone. A lot. I all look at my phone during dinners, but I'm trying yeah. to be better because they're grown up. So they can say, get off that phone, you know? So, and I understand that it is kind of rude if I'm on my phone and we're trying to have family dinner. So um, they've taught me as well. Got to pay for the dinner somehow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hustle. <laughs> Any final thoughts? Final thoughts about the Real market? Estate, anything you'd want to put out there? Uh, like it's still a seller's market. I don't know how the interest rates are going to be affected with this whole uh, situation. I know, I, I feel like it's still going to be a seller's market, It's but it's going to start to kind of like stabilize a little bit where we've had like 30% rise in prices. It's not going to be that crazy rise in price it's going to just kind of go at a very slow and steady pace, but not going to be crazy like how it's been the last two years. Anyone else? 
we've had appraisals coming in low, which kind of makes my heart happy a little bit because I can't stand to see the houses that my, you know, the average yeah. price a few years ago was 250 around here and it's 550 now. And exactly. people can't even buy, get, first time home buyers can't even buy a home. So yeah. I'm okay with seeing appraisals come in low and having them hold those prices down, even though the market is telling it to go higher, something has to stop it from going up 20% a year. But even if the appraisal comes in low, the buyers are willing to go up and above the appraisal. So I know. And so when the next home comes on the market, they have the comp to support it. So it's already, yeah. it doesn't make any difference. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, the issue that we're running into in the Temecula Marietta area is we're getting a lot of San Diego and Los Angeles people that are selling their homes all top dollar. Uh -huh. and Temecula Marietta, which is a little bit more cost effective. And we're the Temecula Marietta, you know, people that are buying and selling in the Temecula area, they're getting outbeat by all these yes. people that have cash in hand. Um, that's one issue that we're having with a lot of, you know, I have a client who's going to be selling their house, but they still want to stay in the Temecula Marietta area. Even though he's selling his house, he's not going to gain as much equity as like people that are coming from San Diego pricing or LA pricing. I agree. It's hard. Florida, we're getting the same thing because all you people from California are coming here <laughs> with cash in hand, not to mention the New Yorkers and the Canadians. And they've sold their house for a fortune and they come here and they get something yeah. for, it's still half the price, even though it's twice as much as we think it should be. So it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. That's how it is here. Them. Sorry. I said, that's how it is here. People moving in, getting stuff. Cause we don't have, I, in my area anyways, I don't see the cash that's coming in a lot, but they are coming from California. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cash doesn't get you inside the velvet rope all the time. Mm -hmm. We had 14 offers, seven of them were cash. And here in California, we have a lot of investors mm -hmm. purchasing homes, holding on to it, and then reselling it the next month. Um, wow. And yeah, it, ha it happens in, this, in our price range as well, where people have bought it and just probably put in recess lights and a fresh coat of paint and then increase the price by 200,000. And I'm like, what have you done? Yeah, I went to Home Depot and put in a light switch anymore. Yeah. And so, and then people are still buying those houses with just recess lights and a fresh coat of paint, $200,000 after six months. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay, like, guys, oh. thank you so much for being here. I'm going to mix thank this you. up every quarter or so. We'll change the people around, do this again. Thank you. Get to know each other on Facebook, friend each other. In my mind, you all talk to each other every week because I talk to you all the time. And <laughs> it's just been such a pleasure. Thank you for being here. Thank, Thank you. Nice, nice to meet you, everybody. ladies. Nice Thank you, guys. You. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.